Welcome everyone. Welcome to Rewriting Our Past, Poems as Engines for Memory with Christina Oliveres and Girls Right Now. We are so excited to have you all here and to get into some really juicy writing. My name is Andrea. I'm going to be co-producing today. And today, or I guess I should say tonight, uh, we're going to start off with hearing a craft talk from Christina. We're going to also get into a sneak peek of the forthcoming, forthcoming Ungovernable. Then we'll have three writing prompts. So we'll write for a bit of time and then share. So without further ado, I am going to pass it over to the amazing Christina Oliveres. Thank you so much, Andrea and Tatiana, and I'm so glad to be here with all of you today. Um, my name is Christina Olivares, and I am a poet and educator. Uh, I am from the Bronx. I live in the Bronx. I'm in the Bronx right now. It's nice outside, so you might hear um, my neighbors driving around and the really loud music. Um, I've been myself listening to a ton of Miguel as I've been editing the second book, which is how, that's how we opened. Um, I hope that was joyous for you as it was for me. Um, yeah, I'm so I'm so excited to be here with you to close out National Poetry Month. It's a month of a lot of joy for all of us who engage in this kind of work. And um, it's just, uh, yeah, so it's lovely to be here with you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, who I am and why I write poems. And then I'm going to read you some work. Um, I'm excited for your opening lines, too. We're going to be dealing with uh, safety and joy and invention and imagination and a little bit of memory work. Um, but memory is, is very much connected to our imaginations. And so our memories that come as a result of these opening lines and then later in your prompts may not be literal. Uh, they may be imaginative, they may be glimpses of memory and so forth. And so I encourage you to lean into um, newness and strangeness as you um, create and think through, think through the things that you're making today. Um, I also want to share a suggestion. I'm going to talk for a while as this is structured. Um, I want to share a suggestion um, for listening uh, before I dive in, which is this, to let yourself daydream alongside all of my ramblings. Um, my favorite part of sitting in a poetry reading or a craft talk is um, listening to the speaker with like a notepad or my phone or something to take notes on. Um, and jotting down ideas that sometimes are that person's ideas, but more often their ideas or feelings or sensations or intuitions that arise in response to whatever that person is saying, even if it like doesn't have much to do with what they're actually trying to talk about. Um, so it could be for me, it's sometimes ideas for poems or ideas for letters or notes that I wanna to write to somebody, ideas for conversations that I wanna be in with other people. Um, ideas sometimes about how to revise work that I've already made or like put poems in sequence, things like that. Um, so if that's a helpful tool, I encourage you to use it. Um, I've tried as I prepare these notes for you to share my ideas and feelings as authentically and honestly as I, as I, can, I, I am in this moment on a Friday, um, which is pretty wide open. It's a Friday, like Fridays are great for that. Um, but I wanna just encourage you to be ruthless in your listening. This is your journey as a writer. And uh, if I say something useful, it becomes yours. You know, that's how this goes. And um, if a piece of it sounds like something else that could be useful, then that's yours. Uh, but be ruthless, take it apart, reinvent it, um, and use it for yourself. So that's, that's my hope ultimately that what comes of it is, is like your engagement and, and your, your thinking and feeling uh, alongside me. Um, and if you wanna drop any of that thinking and feeling into the chat, you are always welcome to do that. Um, so yeah, so let's begin. So artists use the tools available to them, I think. And I am a poet because growing up, language was the tool that was most available to me. Um, in the 1980s, uh, the Black American theorist, lesbian, feminist poet, Audre Lorde wrote, of all of the art forms, poetry is the most economical. It is the one which is the most secret which requires the least physical labor, the least material, and the one which can be done between shifts, in the hospital pantry, on the subway, and on scraps of surplus paper. As we reclaim our literature, poetry has been the major voice of poor working class and women of color. 
I've turned over for many years what Lord meant when she talked about secret, and I've come to a lot of different conclusions. I think there are many answers to that question, and tonight I'm settling on this. Um, I don't have to tell my secrets to anyone. My secrets are my business, like your secrets are your business. But as writers, it is useful to be curious about what our own secrets are. It is useful for me to turn over my secrets and examine them because that is where all of my scraps of wisdom live. The power of an art form that works in language is its ability to surprise, to direct the reader or listener, to see themselves and to understand themselves, even in a glimpse for a second longer than we normally do. I grew up like hopefully some of you listening in the Bronx and I grew up in public housing. My father struggled with mental illness, which led to multiple arrests and us being evicted from one of our apartments um, and other things. Um, by high school, we were living outside of New York City, upstate. I had emotional and practical responsibilities that set me apart from some of the kids that I went to school with and made me closer to some of the other kids that I went to school with. Um, I had secrets and I also had a lot of things I wasn't really ready to talk about when I was a teenager. At that time in my life, which is when I became a poet, um, trying to write prose, trying to write stories felt to me too concrete, too logical, and too defined. But poetry allowed me everything I needed and wanted to make art that wasn't logical or complete and to make it anywhere, like Lord said, on scraps of paper, on the bus, in class, um, while watching my brothers or cousins at work in a grocery store. I wasn't always writing, but I was beginning at that point to think and feel like a writer, like an artist. I was beginning to listen to how I felt about things, to how I felt about people. Um, and I was beginning the practice of trying out in language ways to say what I thought and felt and saw and heard. I felt if things felt fractured around me, I needed an art form that would allow me to make work and would say, yes, those fractures are okay. Um, and I was also interested, especially, I mean, always, but it felt especially important when I began to, to tell the truth, even if it didn't look like other people's truths. I felt like I needed to tell the truth and to say what was true for me, because when I listened to other poets do that, I felt uh, more free. I wanted to free myself. And over time, I felt that if I was going to walk along this path of being a poet, of making poems, of being in community with poets who are also, I think at best committed to like understanding themselves and using language to make art um, and build more freedom in the world that I could contribute and eventually some of the things that I made could also help other people in the way that I've been helped. So I, I'm saying all that to say that sticking with poetry has been the best decision I've made in my life um, because it's given me a community and also an art form that rewards honesty and rewards self-knowing and rewards authentic community um, and, and real listening, um, both to myself and to other people. Um, so line by line, when I'm making work, there's a lot of joy in that for me. The joy is extremely helpful because joy is what we need to get through this life. Um, sometimes I write something and it pings. I feel, I feel it as a, as a physical sensation when I get to a part in a, a point in a poem, uh, when it, when it begins to work, I feel, um, for me, like for me, how it happens, it's like a calm that enters. Like I just feel perfectly still inside focused on that piece. Um, for other people, I know it feels many, many different ways. Um, sometimes it feels like just anxiety leaves and you're like, oh, okay, like I've got this. Sometimes you feel tremendous excitement. And sometimes it's not until you hand it over to somebody you trust um, that it begins to feel like it, it's, it's in their seeing and their witnessing of something that you've made that you begin to understand that, oh, this has value. I've made something that has moved somebody else. I've made something that's touched somebody else. And that's where, um, that's where the importance of community, I think, comes in. Um, I think it, community in terms of writing can take a lifetime to build and not in a way where like you have to get to through your whole life in order to build that community. For me, it's been it's just a continual process of bringing more people in and more people in and knowing people and finding ways to connect with people who are making work uh, that's different from my own. And everybody's work is really different. I think if you're 
focused on listening to yourself and trying to articulate your own truths. Um, your truths are not gonna look like anybody else's truths. My truths are not gonna look like your truths, um, but they're still compatible. You know, If the work is honest and loving, it's still compatible. And that's, that's the joy of being in community is being part of this chorus of voices. Not everybody's saying the same thing. Not everybody understands everybody else's reality in the same way. We can't possibly do that. Um, but we can try and we can listen and we can learn that way. Um, we have, I think, yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. I wanna talk about narratives in a minute, but I'll get there in a second. Um, I think I also, I wanna say something also like my community in, encompasses people, I identify as queer and Latinx and my community encompasses a lot of people who are queer and who are Latinx. Um, but my, you know, it, it's not just people my age. It's not just people with my cultural identification. It's not just people with my gender and my sexuality orientation. But but I think what unifies and what, what feels comfortable and safe in that community is that I've been very lucky in, in my searching and in my building to find others um, who are interested in learning um, about different experiences and we meet each other and we also work through anything that prevents us from seeing each other. I think there's a real collective desire to build a community that feels um, beloved in a sense and in order to sustain our work and sustain each other um, because of the tremendous forces I think that exist particularly in this country that would uh, divide us from ourselves and then also from each other. Um, there are there are poets I look to who've not been able to land a press for their second book. Um, and there are people who are a lot wiser than me who've not published a first book. And I think that's an important note to make also. Um, we make poems and we make poems and we make poems together despite and regardless. Um, this world, you know, because my, my community is mixed, it's mostly people of color. Um, it's mostly, but not all entirely queer. Um, we range in age from our 20s to our 70s. Um, the, the world that like the, the world and sort of publishing as an industry doesn't always reflect our lived experiences. And therefore when we're rendering our experiences in language, um, those experiences are not always recognizable um, and therefore can go unpublished. And so that, I, I think that's just important to note, I noticed that when I published my first book, a lot of younger writers came to me and said, how did you do it? How did you do it? How did you do it? And I don't know, it felt extremely lucky. I don't know, I don't know what it, I, ha I had so much trouble. Um, I was not able to publish a single poem out of my first book as a standalone poem, but the book itself, um, I was able to publish as a whole book. And I think there's something to that that's worth noting that sometimes sometimes it is luck and circumstance and it's it's subjective and the most important thing is to continue making work that feels right and real and honest um, so that you you are proud of what you make regardless of how it lands or sits in the world and that it feeds your community um, who will always be by you um, no matter what the accolades are what the publishing looks like and so forth um, the central question of my work in terms of the public facing part of it has, has moved over the course of my life from the question of how can I be celebrated to how um, can I celebrate and sustain my communities, um, the communities that hold me and read me and um, keep me honest. The first book of poems I wrote, which is called No Map of the Earth Includes Stars, was a way that I worked through some of the traumas that I experienced growing up. It was a difficult book to write, but doing so allowed me to name on my own terms and set to rest, or at least soften and reclaim inside of me some of my own hurt. At that time, several years ago, that was what I needed to do. I needed to dive directly into the painful thing um, with support. And I can't, like, that's incredibly important if you're gonna take on that kind of work in your art making is to, to, to have support for that because memory work that brings you close to trauma or trauma sources, um, sometimes can exhaust you in ways that you may not even know are coming. You may think, well, I lived it, so of course I can think about it. But then sometimes, sometimes your psyche just doesn't wanna do that. 
And so it's really important to, to, to feel uh, supported in that work as you're taking it on. Um, and there was a glimpse in my life where I felt prepared to do it and I just did it. Um, but I don't know, I don't know that I could write that book now. I don't know that I, I could do that. I don't know that I could have written it the year before I did. I think there was just a particular window. It felt like, okay, I could do it. Let me do it. <laughs> and then I got it out. And, and I don't, you know, I don't know. I think on some level, you know, I want to say, or I thought going in, I thought, oh, if I write this book, this particular sequence of poems about my father, if I write this, it'll be cathartic. It'll heal me. It'll fix me. And, and maybe some parts of it, you know, I was able to rename in my own language and that was helpful. It was helpful for me to recast my experiences for myself on my own terms. And also it was like, it was like really hard and um, I made art and that was great. And I don't know that I would recommend that as a process. And so when it came to working on the second book, Ungovernable, which I will read to you in a bit, um, I wanted still to deal with memory and I wanted to deal uh, and, and name things on my own terms and, and, and sort of find my way through, through a particular history. But I didn't wanna do, I didn't wanna take the same like, like head on approach. It felt like maybe that's not how healing happens. Like maybe there's a, a, another way that I can do this that will feel joyful and allow me to claim or reclaim myself without, um, I don't know, without doing the very hardest thing. Like, I think that we don't always need to do the very hardest thing in order to make the best work, you know? Um, we don't always need to bleed for the page or for the reader. Like, we don't always need to do that. Like, sometimes it's just a matter of finding another way around it. And so the, the, the way in, um, the way in uh, for this, this sequence that I'll read in a bit is, was a dream. So I had a dream. And I knew, I knew when I woke up from the dream that I could make, that that was the way in. It was like the dream itself felt like a pathway. And that was great. And I don't usually remember my dreams. I have a lot of trouble remembering my dreams. So when I get them and I can hold them and I wake up and they're still there, it feels like very special. Um, but I had a dream. I dreamed that I was little and I was in this community garden that uh, I'd been in a lot when I was little. And it was nighttime. Um, but it wasn't scary, which is great. The dream felt really good. It's one way to listen to your dreams. Like, how do you feel when you wake up? I felt awesome when I woke up from this dream. But it was a wild thing that happened. Like in the garden, a huge tree had taken root and burst through the garden. And it was night and there were so many animals and birds singing and um, in the tree. And it was like the depths of summer and the community garden was still in the Bronx. And it was beautiful and safe and alive. And I woke up from that, uh, maybe I had that dream maybe three or four years ago. And I woke up and I hadn't, I hadn't thought about being in that garden for many, many years, for maybe for definitely over a decade, I hadn't had the thought. So the force of memory and the force of surprise and also the dream sort of imposing itself over, over my actual memory, um, was the, the gate, it was a door, the doorway into the book that I eventually made. The tree doesn't appear anywhere in the book. Um, I don't know what the tree was. I don't know why it like burst through this earth. I don't know why. But in, in, in dealing and in, in, in beginning to, so I sat down and I began to write my memories of being in that garden. And so just in terms of context, um, I am older and I grew up in the Bronx in the 80s. Uh, I was born in the early 80s. And I, my aunt and her friend um, also lived in the Bronx and in, in, in the central Bronx and they petitioned the city. The city had a program at that time um, in which they, you could ask and say, I wanna start a community garden in this abandoned lot over here on the street. And they'd be like, okay, cool, cool. And they'd give you like, <laughs> Uh, some very basic tools and maybe some seed packets. I don't really know. I was a kid. I don't know what they got, but they didn't really get much. They were just got permission essentially. And over, uh, over several summers, my cousins and my little brother, my mom and my aunt, her friend and her friend's kids, we, we just turned it into a garden. And the reason there are so many abandoned lots in the Bronx is because in the seventies, there was a wave of burnings and there were arson fires. So people could collect their insurance. And it's a really uh, horrific and interesting history. 
that I encourage you to read about. But because of the wave of burnings in the Bronx, there were lots and lots of buildings that had been reduced to rubble. And then there were lots of lots that we could, lots of lots that we could, um, that we could build out. And so, and so we did. And I was, I was little, you know, I was older than my cousins and my brother, but I was still little enough that my memories of that time do feel like dreams. They do feel like glimpses and traces. And when I imagine them, I know that sometimes I'm misimagining them, that there are uh, parts that I'm, I, I'm erasing for whatever reason, for good or for bad, or just because, I, I don't know, I didn't drink enough water one day and I lost that wrinkle in my brain. Like, I don't know um, why they're not there. Um, but instead of push, I, I think what the first book, what I did was push myself to fill in the gaps and push myself to make a narrative and push myself to explain the things that had happened. But with this, with this, I wanted to let it live on the level of the dream, right? I think we're very lucky as humans that we get to have dreams. We're not so lucky when they're nightmares because that's really hard to wake up from a nightmare. But when they're dreams, it's like our brain is teaching us a different way to kind of be. Like we don't need to string together a story. Dreams are actually, when we have them, they're flashes that when we, upon waking, we turn into a story, we turn into a narrative. So all of that that I told you about the tree bursting out and the, and the things and all that, like, I don't know how much of that actually was in the dream. I know that my waking self turned it into what I told you because that's how my waking self understands how to be. Um, but I wanted this sequence in the book to, to be more, to live more like a dream. And, um, you know, one of the consequences of making that choice then is that we, or I then, am making something that may not be totally understandable to somebody who's reading it. I might be telling you a story that's not really a story. I'm telling you little glimpses or little imaginings that I have that, that are not fully there. Um, and I think that it's okay to do that. Um, I'm gonna read, I think we're at the time where I should start reading. Yes, I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read from this now. Um, and as I read, uh, I, I, it's, it's on the page so you can, you can see how it's structured. The poems are structured in different ways or the, the pieces of the poem are structured in different ways throughout the sequence. Um, but imagine instead of being a story, imagine that it's a dream and let's go from there. So let me read pieces to you. So our America is, the one thing I wanna say about this before I start reading is that I wanted also to imagine the Bronx in a way that the Bronx is not often imagined, which is as a, as a rich and alive space, that the Bronx itself is a garden, that the Bronx itself um, is fundamentally rich, that it's not lacking, um, that it's a place of a lot of life and a lot of birth and rebirth. Our America is botanic. Sparrows line sneaker hollows thrown over a telephone line with nests. At dusk, we are little, crowded in a back seat, dirt funky, playing the quiet game. We break when we spy McDonald's, glow singing us, singing back as a lady in front wavers high, high, high. It's always apocalypsing, apocalypso, riddled earth body tilts as it sprouts us in this homeland, our homeland, our America, unpractised parent, unparalleled lover, like the burning a body does when it is touched, the burning a home does when it is torched. And slowly that summer, the next summer, gliding into three summers, we conjure a real garden from a rubbled lot like sprout, lit, small grasses waving, been on fire or been left alone to grow, accidental, inconsequential, echoes, astral, this tiny garden we wanted so bad. Lean out the windows, call, hey, hey, hey. D and recompose our green, this swollen green, our milky murky, our studied shoots bleaked on sky, summer stunners before the city, decades later, rich again, takes it back. On a yellow bus, our young gods instruct us to sit up front, Small thing and feet that don't touch a floor, tracing my finger along the breath pattern glass with growing fire in my belly as neighborhoods zip past more and more familiar until they implode dizzily, joyfully into the shock of my own. 
When we park for our field trip, I tell my teacher, that's where I live and point towards the lofty gray building above us. It's squat windows, it's apartment letters painted on the outside, it's face full of camera eyes. She's blank, instructs me inside. On the way out, I try again. Her blankness meets me a second time. I see it root, fix itself inside and blossom. I understand the trouble is my botanical talk, my little claws, what my home is. We're upwind from a bakery that churns the air burnt and sweet all day, all night. We always want cookies, especially in the summer when the windows are open and we're lazy with heat. Our young God gathers me up to read poem after poem for her homework. They all talk Spanish over our heads. A cousin says ax instead of ask, but I'm not allowed to. Summer marked by the garden, the sun marveling us, this itchy wanting for cookies for our skin to burst into glitter. She had horses who danced in her mother's arms. She had horses who thought they were the sun and their bodies shone and burned like stars. I sneak into the kitchen to scale the countertop for sweets tin sealed on the fridge. She yells, don't touch the oven. It ain't even on, isn't. Are we imaginable? This is a love song to a place, a place that is queer, a love song to a place of queerness, a love song to the queers I love. That summer I dreamt a pony at the door and I woke up, my young hands poking and the dusk light squared above and so eagerly wishing for the being I dreamed. I check, breathless, all ripe want, for me, also for us. No pony. What's a pony to a girl child in the projects? A regurgitated dream, a fever dream of your best girl self? Beautiful, hot to the touch, unoriginal. Can you be good enough for one to appear for you? First you, then the dream of the queer animal you are afraid to be. Such good, good girls both. I say the Bronx burned. What I'm sure of is we ate its earth as children, a transfer of desiring. Silky threaded little bodies plus burn lands, milky sustaining, coating and becoming in us a redressed burning. Desire in it as an us to be ever more and more embodied. A burned earth resituated and made new again in our new little bodies, a queer love song. This is how our America built itself inside of us, a botanical inverse that survived and made new America almost fully ours. I think we can stop there in the interest of time. Um, okay, good. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So that is just a little bit of it. It is a little dreamlike. Um, I'm glad you liked it. Um, and I think we're going to use, this is how we'll do it. So you have, and in, in your opening lines, um, you listed some spaces or you have the opportunity to visit that now if you haven't had a chance to do that yet. Some spaces that uh, feel safe to you. The spaces can be digital, they can be physical, they don't have to be a whole room or a place. They could be a thing you carry with you, but a space that feels where you, you experience safety. Um, safety can be complicated. Um, so I ask you to pick the easiest thing, not the hardest thing. I want you to pick the easiest thing. Um, and what I would like you to do is draw that space. Um, draw that space. And you can draw it physically. I'm not very good at drawing. So I do things like I might uh, make a square that is a backpack and put a book and write the word book on it. You see, like this is my backpack and this is my book in my backpack, like something like that. Like it could be very basic, but I want you to physically map the space in, in a minute or so um, using words, using images, using little symbols. You're not gonna have to share it. I know I just held my paper up, but you're not gonna have to do, I'm not gonna ask you to do that. Um, and that's the first step. And then the second step is that once you've mapped out your space in couplets, which are two lines at a time, I want you to write a poem talking back to that space. When I say talking back, I mean, you can write kind of from any perspective you want, um, but I want you to, to play with that space a little. Maybe in your couplets, you're describing what the space looks like or feels like or smells like. Maybe you're describing what the space reminds you of. 
Maybe you're imagining somebody else in that space with you, but locate your poem or your two lines in the space itself. Okay, if you have questions, drop them in the chat, happy to clarify, but also like any direction you wanna go in is, is totally great.
I, I suggest a couplets because um, they're like little conversations with each other, like little two lines that live together. And the, the other element that's in conversation with a couplet is of course the space above and below them. So while they can be, they, you can pack in a lot, uh, you can kind of fill them, you can fill them with a lot of energy, you can make them very tight. Um, they do trend towards chill, especially in earlier drafts because of all of the space that's built in. It allows you as the writer to kind of um, be considering about it a little bit. So that's why I suggested that form. Of course, if you did not use that form, that is totally okay. So here's, here's, the, here's the next one. Um, before you start writing, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. So maybe we don't start the timer just yet. Um, what I'd like you to do is you can use the space that you just used. You can, that's totally fine. You can also use a totally different space. It could be a space that you listed in your opening lines or that you thought about before. It could also be some other space. But I think the key here is to pick a place where you already experience or have experienced or imagine yourself experiencing um, some safety. And now what I'd like you to do, you have that. So like find one and hold it. Um, and I just want to say, like, if this is a space right now that feels like okay to you, then you can use this space as that, as a, for the purposes of this particular exercise. Um, what I would like you to do now is imagine, um, let's find my language because I wrote it down. I want you to imagine that you are you and we are here. Um, but I want you to imagine that you are free and that you are safe and that you are loved. And um, a condition, I think, of all of our freedoms, I think a lot of really great writers and thinkers have said this, and so I'm echoing, a condition of our freedom is that we're all free. Um, and a condition of our safety is that we're all safe. And so if you can imagine that not only are you free and safe and loved, but that everybody around you is also free and safe and loved. I want you to re-enter the space that you were just in or pick another space, as long as it's a space where you feel some safety and write a poem from that space. It could be in whatever form you want. It could be couplets, could be short lines, could be images, could be not images, could be little blocks of text, however you want to do, whatever structure, totally open in terms of structure. Um, but I want you to imagine entering the space with, by carrying that and um, just try it out and see what happens, okay? You can always modify this prompt. You can change it in any way you want. You can move in a different direction, totally fine. The prompts are suggestions. Um, always follow your instinct when it comes to your, your writing. Okay, I'm done talking.
Um, I'm going to describe to you the third prompt, but we're not actually going to do it. Um, the reason, one, one of the reasons I wanted to um, screen share as I was reading to you the excerpts of the work was because um, part of my process is very driven by how the work appears on the page. Sometimes I see the form in my head um, before I know kind of what's going to go in there. Like I, like I feel it structurally before um, before I know always what the content is. Um, and so I, I encourage you to take something that you thought of today or felt through today, a, a, a piece of a poem, a line, and play with it in different ways. Um, you can constrict it to like a block text to make one long rectangle. I had a poem on there that was like one long narrow rectangle that sat on one side of the page. There are also pieces I showed that use the whole entire page and just kind of spread out in this sprawling, um, maybe more dreamy way. And so I would encourage, I do encourage you to play with the space on the page. I think sometimes when we're just reading the work out loud, that visual aspect of it gets lost, um, but can, can be a whole sensory experience that you give yourself and also give your reader um, as you're making and revising your work. So that's, I think that's the, the last little bit of a takeaway that, that I have for you. Um, and we can, I think we can move on to, to questions, if anybody has any questions. I feel like I don't really have finales is, is um, a thing that I've been working with. Sometimes uh, I published a poem like 10 years ago and then I'm still, I'm still using that to make other poems from, because it's not, it's not that it's not done. It's that like, it's about sitting. So part of my family is Cuban and uh, the first time I went back to Cuba, I sat, there's like a seawall in Havana, which is the capital city. And it's like, just like a raised, it's like, it's like the barrier. So you don't fall in the ocean. It's like that, but people sit on it and like people strum music and people eat popcorn and, you know, lovers meet and, and people have read their books. And it's just like, it's a very active space. And I was so moved by being there uh, that I wrote a poem about it. And I just wrote it, it was like very visual, I wrote it and it got published. And I don't know that it got published too early, but like I keep using lines or fragments of that piece in other work even now, like there's a piece coming out in Ungovernable that really draws from, from that poem. So I guess I try, I've let go of, for me, because it all feels like it's kind of all still swimming in me sometimes. I don't know, I mean, there's certain pieces I've written that are done. Like there's a sequence about my father and no map of the earth includes stars and about he, he, he um, struggled with mental illness. And I wrote that through a series of petitions or prayers to a particular Orisha in Santeria, which is um, an Afro-Cuban religion that um, I am a part of. And that feels done, it feels complete. But I think part of the reason that feels complete was because those poems were so heavy. There was so much heavy lifting that I don't know that I can go back in there. But uh, the rest of it, kind of everything else always feels very up for grabs for me. And just because a thing is published and it has like a stamp of approval externally, it doesn't mean somehow in me that it's done. And I wish it did because then I could just leave it alone, but it doesn't always do that. And I think, um, I think that's, it has to be okay because that's what it is for me. Um, but I'll revise something and revise something until it turns into something different. Sometimes I need somebody to be like, okay, you're done with this now. Let me take this away, you know, from you. Um, which is the importance of community, I think, sometimes too. Um, it's a good question. Is it hard to get an agent? Um, a lot of poets don't have, some poets have agents, especially poets that work across multiple disciplines, like poets who are also essayists or also like fiction writers. Um, I do not have an agent. Most of the people I know who are poets don't have agents. Um, publication for me for the first book came through winning a contest. 
And so that's how that first book came out. And then the second book, um, an excerpt of that first book simultaneously won two different contests, which is wild. Um, but the, the press, the press that was trying to publish a smaller piece of it then offered me a book deal on the second book, which is how I have the second book coming out. But it, it's unagented for me. My process is not agented, so I can't unfortunately speak uh, about what that's like. Um, and I don't know how difficult, the question about difficulty, like I don't, I don't know. I think for some people, it seems relatively straightforward. They have a, a work in hand, they shop it around, they find people who will represent their work for them. And sometimes it's quite, quite difficult, I think, to find an agent, but I don't really know much past that. Um, that's a really great question, thank you. So writing allows you to discover so many little doors about yourself, but I'm curious on how you really keep up with it all, what keeps you motivated if you don't mind me asking. So, I don't know, I talked a lot about community and, and I was thinking like, how can I be more concrete about that? And I just feel like I've, I've encountered, like every time I listen to a writer who I like, or I feel like is saying something that feels reasonable and makes sense to me, um, I try to be their friend. And, and, um, and, and, you know, it took me, I don't know, I think especially many of us who had harder life circumstances or more difficult things happen to us. Like we don't always know like who would make a good friend. Like sometimes we don't pick the right people, but it's like sometimes, so sometimes a little bit of trial and error, but my criteria is, is this person interested in my heart? Is this, will this person be interested in me knowing their heart a little bit? Um, are they curious about me? Can they permit some curiosity about them? You know, um, and then and then I made a community of writers around me that I again keep keep trying to grow always always. And so part of what keeps me motivated are the people who are around me. Like I love my friend. My friend is doing a reading, or my friend is involved in this thing. I want to go support my friend. I'm going to go to her reading. I'm going to go like listen to the thing. She has a poem come out, or he has a poem come out, or they have a poem come out. I'm going to read their poem, and and that it's sort of like puts you in a cycle of like being inspired by the people who are around you, and um, eventually, I mean, I don't ever forget about you know younger writers or people that I don't know reading my work, you know, but at a certain point, like the community that I'm in becomes my primary audience. They become the people I feel responsible to. And like, um, I don't know, like this month I was in uh, what's called a 3030. It's like a national poetry month thing. And we, I'm in this group of people and it just kind of arose. Uh, and we send a poem to each other every morning. Um, I fell off this week, but we're supposed to send it every morning. And then we all just like write kind of loving things at each other. We don't even try to criticize each other, uh, which I don't know if that's helpful or not, but it's extremely loving and it's a nice way to be. So I would say that the thing that keeps me going is that I also want to say though, that I think a lot of writers get up and they're like, oh, you know, everybody should have a writing practice every day. If that works for you, if that's your vibe, if that's how your spirit is inclined, yes, do that. I don't do that because I don't, I don't always have words in me every day. I don't always have a thing that I wanna make, but I do feel like the way I try to exist in the world is as a poet, like I try to exist with, like I'm curious about things. Like I wanna, like, I wanna try to figure them out. I wanna listen to the people around me. Like I wanna build more love around me. And like those, that, the, that makes me a poet as much as kind of the amount of poems that I make, you know? So I think it's like partly like how you're thinking about your life and how you're building your community around you as much as it is about, you know, about the work that you're making. I've gone like, I went in the pandemic, especially, I was like pretty sick for a lot of the pandemic and I went like months without making anything new. And that doesn't make me not a poet, you know, just as much as like having a book, which is totally random that I have a book, I'm about to have two books, equally random, double random. That's, that also doesn't make me a poet. What makes me a poet is how, you know, is, is like wanting to be and coming back to it over and over again and finding that, you know, I started writing, I don't know, 25 years ago and I'm still writing. And so I guess that makes me a poet, even if I'm not writing every day or even, even every month and sometimes not for months at a time. Um, so that's how I would, I would answer you. There's a question about um, dreams and work and practice. And I think I just, I would say that um, I try to let go of, sometimes I want my poems to be understood and sometimes it's okay for me if they're not. And um, so that's one piece of it. Like sometimes the dreamy aspect of it makes them a little bit less understandable and I think that's okay. Um, so permission, giving yourself permission I think is important. 
if that's a thing. Um, and then the other piece of it is that I really think the work of the artist, one of the big works of the artist or big works of a writer or a poet is to help imagine um, ourselves out of this current disaster that we're in uh, and have been in forever in this country. And so imagining is like really important. And sometimes, sometimes, uh, so I'm imagining is, is the way out. If we can't imagine it, I don't know how we're gonna get there. I don't know how we're gonna get to freedom if we can't even imagine little pieces of it. And sometimes the little pieces that we imagine don't come as full stories. And so I think that also writing in little glimpses is a, is a nice way to cultivate a practice of imagining ourselves in, in something different or with each other in a different way. Um, and then I think the last question, um, are, is there moments during your writing process where you feel the emotions in your poems are too heavy to share? Uh, what would you say is the balance between your personal emotions and the audience's reactions to them? Um, yes, okay. Um, Sometimes I feel like the emotions are too heavy for me in that moment. And that's an important thing for me to keep a pulse on because trauma is real and like we can reactivate it fully just by remembering something and trying to write it down in too much detail. Like sometimes that could mess a person up for days. So I have to be really careful sometimes about how deep you go when you start to feel inside of you. Like maybe sometimes I feel it as like, I just start to shut down, like little pieces of me just start to shut down or I don't want to do it or whatever. Sometimes I just feel sad. I don't know, it's a lot of emotions. So uh, I try just a lot of gentleness, a lot of gentleness, a lot of gentleness, really, really important. That's, that's how I approach it. And if, I mean, at this point, like if I don't want to go somewhere, I just don't go, you know? I listened to a lady on the train once tell her son, he had come home, I guess, from his father's house. She told her son, and so he had seen something there that made him uncomfortable. And he was young, he was maybe seven or eight. And it was just her and him. And it was like very early in the morning. We were all on our way somewhere. It was like drinking, it was pre-pandemic, and no mask, I was drinking my coffee and listening because what else are you gonna do on the train? And she just kept saying to him over and over again, if you're not comfortable, you leave. If you're not comfortable, you don't have to be anywhere that you're not comfortable. You deserve safety. You deserve to feel loved. You deserve to be in a place where you are safe. You are always safe with me. You don't have to be anywhere you don't want to be. And it just, it felt like, I, like, I don't even, I can't even describe to you how that felt, but I try to conjure that energy as I'm approaching my own writing. I don't have to be anywhere that I don't feel safe in my own writing. This is my writing. This is, my writing is my house. I don't have to feel unsafe in it. And so I, I, I think that that is the thing I would offer. And then, um, but in terms of like writing a poem that could be hurtful to somebody else, or maybe, maybe somebody else will think it's bad or not understand it you know, I, getting away from the idea of the audience, making some space between you um, and yourself so that the audience becomes, you, then you make a choice about whether or not you share the work, but at least you and, and we and I am giving myself an opportunity to get the thing down on the page um, is really helpful because then I can make decisions about how I share it or who my audience is. So for some of these 30, 30 poems that I've been doing, I know that group of women very well at this point, and they're the only ones who are going to see some of those poems. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Some of those are not for for publication, um, or not for attempt at publication, or to put on a website or anything like that. But, um, but I think the bravery is in getting down the thing that feels honest, um, but also without rocking the boat so much that you might un unbalance yourself in the in the process of doing so. Um, and audience reactions, I try, if it's if it's really, have, I try to, I honestly, I think especially in the pandemic, I've tried to avoid reading things out loud that um, that could be triggering. I just think we're going through a lot right now and like it needs, we need to keep it, keep it easy <laughs> as much as possible. Like we don't need to, nobody has to go to a poetry reading and have more feelings than we had coming in, you know, I mean, or more heaviness than we had maybe, you know, coming in. Although it's fine, we all, I mean, whatever, I'm not trying to, tell other people what to do, but that's that has been my approach over the last uh, 14 months that we've been in this uh, panini. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's, I don't know, I hope that's helpful, I don't, um, yeah, I think, I think that's that. Okay, great. Um, in which physical spaces do I find myself making my work? Um, 
That's a good question. I do a lot of, okay, this is interesting. I've never thought about this before. I, I, the place that I feel safest is my grandmother's apartment. She lives in West Harlem. She's lived there my entire life in the same apartment. And I do a lot of my daydreaming on notes in her apartment, just in and, in and around, like doing the dishes after dinner, like we'll have dinner a couple of times a week, once a week lately, but after she'll, she'll like go watch her novella and I'll be in the kitchen doing the dishes. There's like a quiet that happens that I end up doing a lot of my thinking in that little bit of space I find. So a lot, so the gener the generative stuff, I feel like I do, I do it here, you know, I live, I live in a place where I can do that and it's um, safe to do that. Um, but I do feel like some of the more generative stuff comes comes in her place. Cause I was little there. Like I, I had experiences of being little in her home in her apartment and um, and she's kind, you know? So I, I, think there, I think there's something in that that allows that kind of space for me. Um, I also think a lot, I take walks and I think a lot when I'm taking my walks. Um, so that's, I think the, gener the generative stuff happens there and the editing I can do wherever. You can put me wherever. If, as long as I, if it's not too noisy, you know, I'll put earplugs in or whatever, but I can edit wherever. But generating has to happen in certain places. Um, yeah, okay. That's what I've got. Thank you. I love that we started with places and spaces and ended on uh, spaces and places and where you're most generative. Um, Wow, the sharing tonight was just like really beautiful. And Christina, you are absolutely amazing. Uh, I, we just feel so lucky to have had you here and to be ending Poetry Month in this way. I want to um, encourage everyone to indulge me and in just unmuting and giving Christina a round of applause. You can cheer, you can whoop, I'll start. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yay. Um, so much. This has been really wonderful tonight for me. Absolutely incredible. And you can find Christina's Instagram, um, Twitter, and email that she's graciously offered. And if you put subject GWN, you know, probably have a lot of emails. So maybe put that in the subject just to let her know where you're coming from. Um, and look out for the forthcoming Ungovernable, which we got a sneak peek of tonight. And we can't wait to read and uh, just uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you, Christina. And there's more to come. Uh, really looking forward to reading and continuing to engage with your work. And thank you so much for joining us and, and, and closing out Poetry Month in this way with us. Um, I wanna keep going through to say also thank you to essential workers and everybody who's out there on the front lines, because as Christina said, we are still in this panini thing that we're in and we're all just making it through. So congrats, um, pat on the back and all the love to people who are out there um, on the front lines in whatever way you are. I'd also like to say, if you don't know about Girls Right Now or you wanna be involved, there's a few ways. Of course, you can go donate to support more free programming like this. You can become a Circle member and receive special benefits. And enrollment is now open. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor, having a one-to-one -one pair relationship with a young writer, or if you're a young writer looking to have a one-to-one -one relationship with a, a professional writer or an older writer who can help guide you. Enrollment is open. Go to girlsrightnow.org slash enroll and uh, apply to become a mentee or a mentor. If you go to girlsrightnow.org to learn more, you can go to girlsrightnow.org slash calendar to see what's coming next. And as always, if you share work tonight, you can tag us at Girls Right Now. If you enjoyed your experience, you can tag us. We love to interact on social media and you will be able to find a recording of this event on our website in a few weeks. Anything all all the sharing portions won't be on the recording. So anything that you shared is safe with us tonight. And it'll really just be all of Christina's amazing um, offerings that she gave and the generous, the generous things that she offered for tonight will be in that recording. So look out for that on our website as well. Otherwise, have a lovely night, everyone. You made it through April. We're going into May. So proud of you. See you next time. <laughs>